tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The taxi drove off, leaving Funk on the Hoddesdon lawn, surrounded by valises. Funk was thinking it more than merely odd that Barclay, for whose coaching he'd come prepared to spend a month, had not met him as planned. He tried the screen door. It was hooked inside. Hello in there. There was no response. The Hoddesdon farm lay drenched in a torpid lethargy for which it was obvious more than the July heat must be responsible. Within the house no one stirred. On the surrounding fields no one was abroad. Even the usual sounds of the farm animals were hushed. Funk was unpleasantly affected. Surely the entire household had not gone to meet his train and somehow missed it. He carried his traps to the stoop, crossed the yard to the barnyard, and hallowed again. Hello! He knew of old where Barclay's studio was, so he set off down the path toward the grateful shade of the woods. The gray stone walls of the old building soon glinted through the tree trunks in heavy foliage. A strong conviction possessed Funk that Barclay was not within. In fact, he found the studio door padlocked. He noted that the west window was rudely boarded up. He walked around the studio to the north. Here the trees had been cut down, and the studio wall was entirely of glass. He peered in with deepening curiosity, but apart from the usual litter of easels, painting paraphernalia and accessories, canvases in serried rows against the walls, his attention was almost immediately drawn to a painting propped against the south wall where the full light from the opposite windows poured in revealingly. Hmm, run go, that never is Barclay's work, and he'd never let a student perpetrate such a monstrosity of hue and crude color. He pressed his face to the glass, cupping it against the outside light. That old man, it may be crudely done, but he's also absolutely horrible. His hands, ugh, they're dead hands, bloodless, waxen, ugh. Something about the way he's sitting there drooping as if he hadn't the strength of himself to sit erect and was being held by something, something without that you can't see. I don't like that thing. It's, it's ugly. There's, there's something wrong with it. He said this last with conviction, and as he exclaimed, became aware of another gaze fixed upon himself. He snapped upright and wheeled quickly, waiting patiently for him to finish his examination of the studio's interior stood a man in patched stained blue overalls well uh, mr barclay's at the house sir you're mr funk i'm um, i'm malkaihi hoddiston's hired man uh, all right i'm coming how did mr barclay come to miss my train well we was all down to the police station sir police station what, what what's been going on here I found Mr. Oki uh, dead in the studio this morning, sir. What? Oh, there's something wrong in there, sir. I, I saw the blood on the on the old devil's beard. Oh, snap out of it, Mulcahy. Are you referring to that picture? I am not, sir. Blood on the old man's beard? It's ridiculous. I saw none. Oh, blood it was, sir. And the poor young man's was all drained out of him, sir. Ha! <laughs> this sounds intriguing. Blood on the old man's beard? I'm dripping from his dead finger, sir, and not one drop left in the corpse, sir. Blood all over the damned old devil's whiskers and on his dead fingers, sir. Oh, merry mother. Who did that painting? A man by the name of Silva, sir. He's after being a cabinet maker, but he got to thinking he could paint, so he made that beauty back there. Devil fly away with him. He sure can paint. Oh, he's mixing something with his paint that only the devils from the, the pit can give him. Sir, the night before the poor lad was murdered, there was a fine canvas of Mr. Barclay's cut into ribbons, and Mr. Oakey's prize picture the same. What might that mean, along with the poor lad's being killed the next night? And, and Silva only, only getting honorable mention last week where he was looking for first prize. Oh, looks as if Silva had a motive. Life was stirring normally about the farm now, as if a ban of enchanted silence had been lifted. Funk could see Barclay's bulky body leaning over the valises on the front stoop. 
He hailed his friend, and then asked Malkahi hastily, What do the police say? Any one of us might have done it, sir. But the studio was locked from the inside, and there's no motive. And they can't figure where the poor lad's blood went, sir. Back of the simple words pushed a dark significance of terrible things. Looks as if there were more here than appears on the surface. Oh, right ye are, sir. From now on, Tom Mulcahy wears a blessed medal next to his hide, day and night. Funk met Barclay's welcoming hand with a heartening grip. Uh, sorry to have missed you, Funk, but this ghastly tragedy has dislocated all plans. I, I was fond of the boy. He had a gift, had Harry. Uh, I, was, I was looking forward to what he would do with color in not far future, and uh, now... Where's my room, Barclay? Funk gathered up his bags and followed the other painter up the front steps. Both men lighted cigarettes in silence. Barclay stared abstractedly from the window, while Funk unpacked rapidly, puffing clouds of smoke about himself as he tossed shirts, underwear, ties into the open bureau drawers. I want to know how Silva's paintings got into your studio. So you're taking that attitude? Uh, well, anybody but a crass, materialistic jackass would. No, oh, I didn't know you went in for that sort of thing. Well, I've no time for anything but painting. Just making a living takes most of my time these days, Funk. Well, very little suffices for me. I'm too fascinated with studying the truths underlying the illusions of material existence. Not that I've gotten very far, but uh, what I know, I know. Uh, then perhaps you can say what's unnatural about poor Harry's death. I know there's something wrong about it. Something wrong? Yes, there's something wrong and uncanny about the lad's death. As to its being unnatural, well, there are many strange and little-known laws operating along lines so new to us. Uh, I believe the poor chap's death is due to an extremely interesting example of the transference of an evil will to power. Well, I didn't tell the police what I felt lay behind this tragedy. I have no hankering to live in an insane asylum. Now I have faint hope that you may be able to appreciate the strangeness of my experience. Listen, Manuel Silva settled here a few years ago, and he's been doing well as a cabinet-maker. Recently he learned that I got from three hundred dollars up for a canvas, and he thought this was an easy way to get rich. <laughs> but I refused to teach him. Well, you know I never take any but advanced students of decided promise. My refusal roused Silva's furious resentment. I have instituted an annual art exhibit in town. Silva entered three canvases to force my hand. They were rather terrible. One was a, a blacksmith, dark, sullen, sinister. He was hammering viciously at what appeared to be a battered crucifix. Another was a, a farmer slaughtering a wretched hog that somehow looked like a naked man. The butcher's face wore a too realistic grin of sadistic enjoyment as he wielded his bloody knife. Uh, the third, well, the third was the painting you've just seen in my studio. Harry's entry took first prize. This, this was inevitable. I felt inclined to encourage a couple of young local artists, so I gave them honorable mention, and not to slight Silver's pride, I included him. The night before the canvases were removed, Harry and I were in the gallery, and he pointed out that someone had deliberately cut the honorable mention ribbon and Silver's canvas so that it hung in dangling strips. Odd that, eh? Oh, you're opening vistas. You're absolutely interesting. Well, I criticized Silver's paintings, observing that Harry was right when he said it gave him the jitters, but that in just that degree it possessed a touch of wild genius. Harry pronounced it ghastly. To paint a hunched-up old man as dead as a doornail, his hands frightful, decomposing, yet sitting up there, ugh! Silver's colors were crude, his drawing distorted. Just how it would be difficult to say, but wrong, you understand, just wrong. I said I dared not encourage Silver because of a very strange quality in his work, that that's something wrong. And then we both nearly jumped out of our skins, for in the dusk behind us someone broke into an ugly chuckle, and we turned to see a dark figure slouching out. It was Silver, and I realized that he'd heard me pronounce him an evil genius. Harry made light of my compunctions, but I was, I was disturbed. 
We confronted the old man in the painting once more. As twilight gained the room, a murky dusk seemed creeping into the very canvas. Its shadows deepened. The old man merged into his dark background, all but his pallid face, his grayish beard, the waxen fingers dropping over his angular knees. It was wrong, entirely wrong. And then all at once Harry twitched my sleeve and exclaimed, Let's get out of here. And we turned and plunged into the night, stricken by some subtle panic so obsessing that it was not until we were back at the Hoddesdon farm that we realized how, <laughs> how foolish and unreasonable had been our flight. Funk lighted another cigarette. We went sketching next day, and, and Hoddesdon brought our canvases back to the studio. That night he told me that Silva had sent me one of his for a gift, so Harry and I went down to see which one. We lighted candles, and really we got a nasty shock. The flickering, inadequate candlelight made that old man appear more than ever an entity with a horrid existence, independent of his painted presentment. Oh, my God! Harry said, my God, in, in a kind of comic dismay. And I knew instinctively that Silver was up to no good. He, he bore me malice. His very gift seemed to convey dire menace. In the pale candlelight, the old man's beard appeared to rustle stiffly as if his lips were parting under his bushy shelter. Of course I could not see anything, but I, I felt that I was seeing a, a pale dead tongue flick moisture over dry dead lips. <laughs> oh, that must have been an odd sensation. You make it very clear. Yes? Well, there's more of it, Funk. Oki and I went over our canvases to check on their return in good condition. We were satisfied. Just remember this point, will you? We padlocked the studio door and went off to bed. When we went in next morning, the padlock was undisturbed and all the windows locked on the inside. But one of my best canvases had been slit into ribbons, and Harry's, which had taken first prize, was completely demolished, even the, the, the frame. That last act of vandalism made me feel bad. I'd been sure the boy could cash in on his work, and he needed the money. He took it like a Spartan, but he told me he was going to sleep in the studio that night, for he felt sure that Silva had done the damage. And I agreed, although I, I couldn't figure out how Silva could have gotten inside. So last night I left the boy there. He said he was going to hang something over the old man's gosh-awful face. I offered to stay with him, but he, he wouldn't have it. This morning, this morning, Malkai told me. Uh, it was ghastly, Funk. Mulcahy was howling blood at every jump he took. Blood, he yelled, on the old man's beard. Hmm. How about the coroner? Harry had been dead for hours. Finger marks on his throat. Every drop of blood drained from his body. Mulcahy had seen him through the north windows. I had to break the west window to get in. The coroner said at first he'd had a fit, but finally decided he'd been killed by a person unknown. About the blood? Uh, Melkai was right about it, Funk. I saw it, too. It's not there now. Yeah, that's another strange thing. When I rushed over, I found poor Harry sprawling on the floor, his body all twisted in a grotesque, gruesome position and so terribly white. As I threw myself on the floor beside him, something struck upon my inner ear. It, it was a sound, but such a sound. Even as I heard it, I knew I was hearing what could not be apprehended physically. I sprang to my feet and confronted Silver's hideous canvas. God, it was horrible! Oh. The painted old man sat there motionless, but it was a sinister restraint funk. I stared, stricken by a horror that affected me with nausea, for I saw then that Someone had smeared that ancient's deadly pallor with crimson that crawled down the painted gray beard. The dead hands that hung over the angular knees were dripping ev every pallid fingertip with blood. Blood, Funk! How do you know it was blood? I... I touched it. And then? A ghastly thing came to pass. I did not see it. I felt rather than saw. I became aware with that inner sense of the movement of one of the old man's painted arms. It lifted with the jerking unevenness of, of an automaton and passed across the stained gray beard. I say it moved. I felt it move. Yet at the same time I was aware that it was only painted, hence incapable of movement. 
It was a something else behind it that actually moved. I, 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 I find it almost impossible to clarify my intuitions, other than to say that while the painted figure did not stir, I, I was yet inwardly aware that it lifted one arm and wiped away the crimson from its beard. Then it reached out on either side to drag off that horrible drip from its waxen fingertips against the painted glass that reddened under them. Oh, God! It was more than horrible, because although the figure did not show movement to my straining eyes, yet I saw the crimson lifeblood of poor Harry disappearing from the canvas as those movements which I felt rather than saw took place. <sighs> of course, this explanation is inadequate. Funk pushed the consumed tip of his cigarette to the fresh one he was holding between his thin lips. A cloud of smoke enveloped him. Not adequate, my dear fellow. On the contrary, it is very enlightening. So clear that I believe we may yet punish the murderer of that poor lad. Oh, I'd give a year of my life to accomplish that. Well, I hardly think so much will be required, but you may have to sacrifice one or two of your canvases. We'd better get the rest of Oki's work over here and Silver must learn that you are taking steps to protect Harry's work and your own. He must be informed that tomorrow night you yourself will sleep in the studio. That will bring him. Uh, you agree that it's Silver? I've no doubt about it, but not in propria persona. He's projecting his astral body through that hideous old man, and he's already made a grave error. What do you mean? He's permitted himself to savor human blood, Hence he cannot be permitted to continue. He's dangerous now. He will be yet more so, unless checked. I propose to do this in the only permanent way possible. We have no proof of his presence in the studio, Funk. Who would believe the intangible evidence of my experience? No one ordinarily. But I believe. And there's another person who will not only believe, but will furnish me with the means of putting a stop to Silver's murderous proclivities, without disturbing the authorities unduly. Wouldn't it be wise to return that picture to Silver, or cut it to bits and burn it? Later. You see, Silver has somehow learned how to transfer his will for evil to that creature of his own making. It's through the same creation that we must reach him and stop his criminal career before it's too late. Oh, you speak as if you knew what you were talking about, Funk. I can't just understand you, but I feel that you're, you're somehow right. What do you wish done? Get Melkaye or Hoddiston to clear out all Oki's canvases. Leave only a couple of your own that you don't particularly care about so as not to stir Silver's suspicions overly. He'll imagine you're exhibiting. Then have Hoddiston step in and tell Silver what happened to the canvases in the studio and ask him to have his moved out of harm's way. That will appear a kindly impulse on your part, and he will reply that he'll send for his canvases in a couple of days. He'll figure on polishing you off by then. Agreeable thought, that. Now, you're going to lend me your roadster. I'll be back tomorrow afternoon at the latest. Be sure Sylvie is given to understand that tomorrow night you'll be sleeping in the studio. Under no circumstances, however, venture in there tonight. Tonight, Silver, or whatever wakens in the studio under the stimulus of his evil purpose, may have free play. But tomorrow night, ah, tomorrow night, I shall be there, not you. Oh, I won't permit your getting into a nasty situation, Funk. This, 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 this isn't your affair. After all, Harry was my protégé. It's up to me. Aha! <laughs> Are you prepared to give effective battle to a painted demon, Barclay? Can you, through that painted thing, silence forever the intangible, distant malefactor? You can do such things? I shall know how to, before I return tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but how? I'm going to someone who knows. I shall demand the secret. She will yield it, I'm certain. I'm going to see Gwen Caradorn. Uh, where have I heard that name? Possibly in connection with her published brochures. Her reality of the abstract is fairly well known. It's discussed everywhere. Uh, quite likely. I seem to remember it vaguely. Now, how about your car? It was dusk when Funk returned on the following day. The seriousness and abstraction that wove a cloak about him struck Barclay's curious inquiries into silence. A certain high air about the younger artist forbade imperiously any break upon that lofty mood. Funk's first query was, had Silva been duly informed of the occupation of the studio that night? Oh, he knows. He told Hoddiston that he would call for his unappreciated masterpiece in a couple of days. The words were significantly emphasized. 
I'd rather fancied he'd say that. He knows you'll be there tonight. Uh, Hardiston told him if there were any further trouble, uh, I'd sleep there tonight on to protect his painting. Excellent. And was there any? Yes. Last night the two canvases I'd left were demolished. Good. He'll be expecting you to sleep there tonight. Let's have supper, then I'll run into town and fetch Miss Caradon. She insists upon coming out. The time was too brief to prepare me to handle the situation single-handed. Well, that's extraordinarily kind of her, Funk, but if she's to be at the studio tonight, why, why, why not I? She would have handled it alone, only that uh, she... Sorry, I can't be more explicit, but she bans discussion of herself unless she decides to come out into the open, which she rarely does. She's... Well, wait until you meet her, if she permits it. You, you'll understand then. But believe me, she is worthy the highest respect and admiration a human being could expect. Funk did not have to drive to town. Between dusk and dark, a shining dark blue car with a special delivery body slipped into the driveway. From the limousine-like front, two uniformed men alighted and walked to the rear of the car. There were wide doors there, which they proceeded to open. They withdrew with the utmost care a strange anachronism, a blue and black and gold decorated sedan chair, small and delicate. They placed themselves between the shafts and started toward the farmhouse. Funk exclaimed and sprang down the steps to meet the odd equipage. He bent over what was obviously an extended hand, white in the dusk. Barclay, staring, saw the young artist touch his lips to those extended fingers. A child's high, shrilly, sweet voice gave an order, and the chair-bearers carried the sedan-chair toward the barnyard. Funk followed, calling back as he went. See you tomorrow morning, Barclay. With that he disappeared after the chair into the soft darkness beyond the barnyard. Barclay felt that he could not sleep. He was intensely irritated that Gwen Caradorn should have sent a child to take her place in what he felt must be a post of danger. He went down to the shining automobile and walked around it with curiosity. The rear doors had been closed, and nothing marked it as out of the ordinary, save, perhaps, the expensive type of shock absorbers for a delivery body, and, of course, what looked very like a periscope set in the top, as much out of place as was a modern child in a sedan chair. He sat at his window, fell asleep there in his chair, and did not waken until Mrs. Hoddiston tapped at his door calling that Mr. Funk and the little girl had returned. She volunteered that the little girl was a perfect little French doll. Barclay took the stairs, three at a stride. In the hall Funk sat on a hassock, which brought his face slightly below the level of the small, oval countenance of the child, who sat sedately on the half-chair. Barclay noted with an artist's appreciation the bloom on her dazzling cheeks, the straight nose, the richly scarlet mobile lips. He approved the curling black lashes, finely penciled arching eyebrows, sleek black bobbed hair, her creamy silk dress rather long than worn by most children of her age, apparently about six, was smocked in a knowing fashion with bright colors. Her feet were inappropriately encased in high-heeled French slippers. All this the artist in Barclay captured at a glance just as he took in the beauty of the slender, tiny hands of the taper fingers and the eloquence of every gesture. A strange and unusual child, this. His leaping footsteps brought upon him a lifting of fringed eyelids, and what he felt shrinkingly was a glance of indifference. He stopped short at the foot of the staircase, abashed at this disdainful glance. He knew all at once why this child's frock was longer than customary, why her tiny feet wore adult-style footgear, why sophistication animated those taper fingers. The cobalt-blue eyes that regarded him from the child's elfin face were the eyes of a grown woman. They were the informed eyes of one who had passed through the fires of varied experiences, the eyes of one who had gazed unafraid upon unveiled mysteries. The child was not a child, but was an exquisite midget, a creature set apart from the entire world by her miniature proportions. Funk sprang up, caught the other man's hand, and drew him down to the hassock, himself sinking upon the floor so that both men's faces were below the level of the midgets. Barclay, Miss Caradorn permits me to present you. Uh, honored, Miss Caradorn. Uh... Barclay sat, still confused under the keen gaze of those faintly derisive blue eyes. 
He understood it after a minute. She was touched with amusement at his discomfiture. An elfish smile twitched at one corner of her scarlet lips, and she actually turned away those two shrewd eyes as if to spare Barclay's feelings, a kindly gesture which did not serve to tranquilize him, for there was just a touch of condescension in her half-smile. "'Mr. Funk has been showing me these canvases from your studio. I would very much like that snow scene. It is charming. If you will tell me the price—' I, I would feel honored if you would accept it as a, a proof of my gratitude for your having come here. You're anxious to learn the outcome of last night's plans? Suspended in the bosom of her frock by a slender platinum chain was a platinum whistle which she put to her lips and sounded. At once the bearers of the sedan chair came up the steps and into the hall, holding the chair close to their mistress. Like some bright bird, so airy and graceful was her lithe movement, she seemed to fly from her chair into the sedan's shelter. She waved one tiny hand. The bearers took their light burden outside, slid it into place in the rear of the waiting automobile. They mounted into the front, and the car slipped noiselessly away down the road, bespeaking the many-cylindered motor by its very silence and power. Ah, so that strange little thing is your wonderful Gwen Caradorn. Why didn't you warn me? Funk lighted the cigarette hastily and began surrounding himself with smoke. Why didn't I? Because she won't be talked about. She's proud and sensitive. She considers her miniature body the ultimate of human perfection and won't permit its comparison with what she considers our gross bodies. And she's abnormally proud of her brain. She has reason to be. I, I think it's the most highly developed I've ever known. As an oculist, she's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter. You're anxious to know about last night. She's forbidden me to divulge details, but I may tell you briefly that Silva will never again repeat his evil act. He was there, then, last night? Not in propria persona, but his familiar was already locked in with us when I bolted the door behind Gwen and myself. What, what, what do you mean? Let's go down to the studio. It's easier to understand when you've seen things with your own eyes. The telephone rang. Mrs. Huddleston ran out of the kitchen and answered it. An expression of horror settled on her placid face. Manuel Silva's been found dead with a knife wound in his throat. Funk beckoned Barclay silently, and the two hurried across the barnyard and into the woods. With the key Barclay had loaned him, Funk unlocked the padlock. He pushed the studio door open. Words seemed superfluous. Spread on the floor lay a painted canvas figure, pinned down by a knife through its throat. The edges of the canvas were sharply defined, as if just cut out of the painting leaning against the south wall, with a neatly trimmed vacancy in its center. Barclay stared, closed his eyes convulsively, and then stared again. I couldn't have done it alone. She furnished the power. She'd have done it herself, but she's too—I uh, mean, he—he he was too tall. Barclay stared motionless. He was absorbing the details of a bizarre thing, which confirmed him in his hasty resolution to burn Silva's painting without delay. The empty space in the painting distinctly outlined a drooping, seated figure. The painted canvas shape lying on the floor, pinned down by the knife through its pallid painted throat, could have filled that vacancy twice over. It was a full-length, standing figure. Ghost stories? No, we don't have anything like that around here. We do have the story of Jacob, but that's about as close as you'll get. You really want to know? Well, I'm not supposed to tell you, but... All right. Just no interrupting. I don't have the patience for it. How to describe Jacob Emery? Well, I guess you could say he was the kind of guy you could never take notice of. This isn't to say he wasn't a bad kid in any sense. Many people in this town thought he was the most reliable person for an odd job in the state. But he never really excelled in anything. He was the living proof behind the statement, Jack of all trades, ace of none. Most of this was due to his own lack of will. He dabbled in damn near everything this town could offer him. Automobiles, radio operations, store management, what have you. But he never stuck with anything. 
His friends and workers went after him about it a number of times, but everybody got the same unsatisfying response. It just wasn't enough. Needless to say, any friends he kept were either very patient or never spoke of the matter altogether. It was probably inevitable then that Jacob would leave to go abroad. I don't remember where he went, but I think Gertrude down the street knew before she passed on. You'll have to scout someone else if you ever get curious. In any case, no one even tried to stop him. Everybody thought a little travel would stamp the ambition out of him, or else feed it until it was no longer an issue. Hell, we even gave him a sending-off party, which I thought was pretty nice of everybody. So, anyway, he was gone for six, seven years. I can't remember. You'll have to check with someone else about that, too. Anyways, he came back eventually, and he had changed, obviously enough. He was amiable, energetic, all smiles all the time, and we all quickly learned why. He showed us a souvenir he brought back, a solid black stick, the length of a pencil but the texture of chalk. We all wondered why on earth such a simple thing would prompt such a spring in his step until he gave his demonstration. He took a piece of paper, and with this stick, God, there's got to be a better word for it, with this stick he, he drew a circle, a crude circle, it dropped and rested on the border of the paper like a stone. It didn't leave the paper, but it acted out on it, sort of like an old movie projector on a screen. Son, I know how crazy that sounds, and if you feel like playing skeptic, then you can leave an old man to his craziness, but I know what I saw, even if everyone's been hushing it up. And that stone he drew dropped. Jake even passed around the paper as it was being passed. It rolled around on the paper as it got tilted. None of us had any words for it. Hell, what was there to say? But he continued drawing demonstration after demonstration for us. Stick figures in various pageants and plays doing everything from fighting each other to making perfect human pyramids, and we all thought it was incredible. That was all the go-ahead he needed. He announced that he planned to put on shows to pay for rent and food, where he would draw anything the crowd members wanted. That we talked to some length about, and he eventually convinced us that it would be safe. His drawings, ethical, the practice lucrative and unique, and the attention would not go anywhere outside of the town's borders. Poor Jacob. If I'd not been so swept up in the moment, I might have read the signs right then and there and saved the sorry son of a bitch by snapping the terrible thing in half. But I was younger. We all were. And we saw no problem with encouraging him with what we all saw as an incredible experience to be shared with everyone else. Now, he didn't have any big radio or television connections, mind you, and the internet wouldn't come around for another decade, so he did what all people on a shoestring budget do. He advertised his show with flyers. Flyers might not mean anything to you city folk, but in a small town, they gain a fair glance over from time to time, and what's more, Jacobs managed to stick out by having little figures jump up and down and what not to get people's attention. His first show must have gotten nearly 60 or so people, probably a lot more than that. And his shows were fantastic. Someone would shout out a scene from a play or a comedy sketch and Jake's hand would fly over the white wall like a bird. He'd been holding back when he made that stone, that's for damn sure. His illustrations were all spot on, and he could make an incredible human figure in minutes. Come to think of it, I don't remember any of his scenes lasting more than ten minutes to make. They were all really well done scenes, too. Not only could you see a knight charge a castle, Jake would draw the castle's interior as well, like a wedding cake split down the middle, so you could see the knight scale the walls, fight his way through levels to the dungeon, fight back out with the princess, and 
making a leaping jump off the castle parapets onto his getaway horse all in complete silence. Not realistic, no, but that was part of the appeal. None of us went in there expecting something real. When a sketch or a scene was finished, either the characters would leave off a wall or he'd cover the wall with white paint. That was good, in a way. It gave these shows a time limit, so when he finished with all the four walls in the room, everyone knew the show was over until the paint dried. Jake, meanwhile, was changing in a bad way. I'd mentioned that upon his return, he'd been extremely energetic. Well, that energy, the vitality or fervor or whatever you want to call it, it never left him. Not for an instant. Far from it. It seemed to grow in him, and he enjoyed it all too much. His eyes grew wider, he slept gradually less over time, his statements and opinions were more radical and frenzied, and though he never was a pushover, he was starting to make people nervous in his company. A month or two passed, and Jake's audience grew like a wildfire. Nearly everyone in the town paid to see Jake's art in action, and he had to rent out larger and larger places for them to sit. He now didn't stop after one scene was done. He moved directly onto the next, put on the next blank space on the wall, and sometimes to the intriguing effect of causing scenes to mingle, which the crowd loved. The subject matter got more wild and immoral. The monsters got more bizarre and creative. The fighters, using more impressive weaponry, all for the sake of the crowd's interest. Jake got steadily more indulgent, which we figured was from the money, and he became a drinker and a womanizer, neither of which got rid of that vitality, by the way. Some of the women claimed that they'd woken up in the middle of the night to see him scribbling with that stick on a drawing pad, a gigantic grin on his face. And while most of them said that they'd assumed he was drawing them in the nude, there's rumors that one or two of them got glances at that notepad. Those anonymous few supposedly said that those drawings absolutely weren't nude pictures, but neither of them, whoever they are, will say what he was drawing. Don't bother looking for the notepads or the flyers, though. They're all gone now. I'm getting off track. Point is, he was hitting the bottle. And that's important, because it was drinking that would eventually ruin everything. On the night of one of his performances, he walked in front of the cheering crowd. It was immediately apparent to everybody that he was completely drunk. I was in the front row, and I could smell the bourbon on him from ten feet away. The show started. He went through a bunch of sketches and scenarios that the crowd recommended, when at the end someone asked that he draw himself. Everyone cheered the idea. I guess they'd been wondering what his creations thought of him, and he eventually obliged. No sooner had Jake finished connecting the final two lines on the coat than every single character across the vast expanse of wall all stopped and looked directly at that illustration. Lovers stopped kissing. Clowns stopped laughing. Robots stopped fighting pirates. Everything stopped and looked at the Jacob illustration. The crowd died almost instantly. I remember Jake's face at that moment, pale white, full of terrible comprehension at his mistake and looking desperately for the cans of white paint he'd forgotten to put up before the show. Everyone else? They were looking at the fake Jacob. That Jacob reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a black stick of his own, and as we all watched, drew a door. Pushed on his side, and the door swung open, allowing him to walk through onto the floor of the auditorium. The rest was an absolute hellish pandemonium. People screamed and ran for the exits as Jacob's characters, both those currently on the wall and those which had previously left before being covered up, ran out of their own exit, throwing pies, shooting lasers, blowing fire and poison and the impossible. I was near enough to escape exit and gave only one glance backwards. The scene will haunt me forever. Jacob Emery was being dragged by his creations, kicking and screaming through the door his copy had made. 
The auditorium burned down, obviously enough, but I have no idea how many characters escaped, what happened to the fake Emery, or how many people died. The fire brought the fire department from the nearest cities up to over a hundred miles away. They in turn brought the police force, which brought the government, which hushed up everything. They took the flyers and any art Jacob made and swore everyone to secrecy or else life detainment. The fire was blamed on a cigarette in the garbage during a basketball game, and we all eventually went on with our lives. Jacob was made to never have existed. In retrospect, I realize everything. Jacob hadn't been creating illustrations. Illustrations don't move, much less act or attack. They're just images people see. Shadows made to look like real things. Jacob had been making life actual thinking things in some alternate dimension, using a power that was never meant to fall to mortal hands. He got drunk on his power. His punishment was probably well deserved. Incidentally, the government screwed up on two different accounts. They did a damn good job silencing everyone, but proof remains. The ruins are still there, you know. The auditorium ruins. I hear they're going to start reconstruction soon, which will wipe out any remaining evidence someone can definitely say. But I went back there once, several years after the fire. Just once. Amidst the rubble, covered in ash, I saw something squirming. I looked closer. It was Jacob Emery's hand on the wall, exactly like it had been three years ago. Sweaty, but calloused. I remember but it was constantly flailing, as if the body it was supposed to be attached to was still writhing in flames. That was mistake number one. Number two was those creations. Like I said, I don't know how many escaped, nor how many the government agents found and caught, but I will say only this. Those tall grass meadows on the outskirts of town? Don't go into them. Ever. You were asking about those white figures you've seen at night, right? This town doesn't have ghost stories. I got this package in the mail from my dad. Brown paper wrapping, large but flat, with the word fragile written on it in black ink. When I unwrapped it, it was this big acrylic painting framed in some sort of bronze gilded plaster. The painting was of this long hallway full of doors, kind of like you'd see in a fancy hotel. The walls had edging about halfway up. The upper part was painted in off-white, while the lower half was a crimson red that blended into the carpeting. Between each door was an upturned light. There was also one on the far wall at the end where the corridor seemed to connect to another hallway, running perpendicular to it, disappearing around a corner. It was really amazing detail, though I wouldn't call it lifelike by any means. Just the sheer amount of intricate pieces to each aspect of the scene showed that the artist really paid attention to every little thing, like somewhere in the world was this hallway and you could stand in it and hold the painting up in front of you and, if it weren't for the border and the clearly stylized art, you wouldn't be able to tell where the canvas ended and the real world began. I called him up and thanked him immediately. When I asked him where he'd found it, all he said was that he got it in an auction. I kind of figured as much. So I hung up the painting in my office, just behind my desk, which I later realized wasn't the best place for it. In order to actually look at it, I had to swivel completely around, but there wasn't anywhere better, really, and once I'd gotten it hung up, I felt less willing to take it back down, so I just left it there. It kind of hung out over my shoulder and watched me work, and every now and then I'd turn around and stare at it and get entranced by it, feeling like I could get up and put my hands in the frame and climb into the painting as if the frame were a window. Of course, I wouldn't be writing this if something weird didn't happen as a result of the painting. We had a couple of friends over named Mark and Sabina. Mark and I went into my office when the women started talking about knitting, my wife's new favorite hobby. I sat down at my laptop to find a video I'd been telling Mark about, and Mark wandered over and started admiring the painting. Where'd you get that? 
My dad bought it at an auction and gave it to me. It's creepy. It's not that creepy. It's kind of... I don't know. Hypnotic? Yeah. I turned around to look at it with him while the video loaded. He got up close and ran his finger over the canvas, feeling the raised acrylic. And I just let my gaze wander over all the details again. Hmm. Huh. I didn't notice that before. What? Uh, at the end of the hall, there's some sort of light coming from around the corner, and it's casting a shadow on the floor. I got up and looked closer. I really hadn't spent a lot of time studying the far end of the hallway. There was definitely some yellow and some darker colors making what looked like the shadow of a person coming from around the corner. I even reached out and touched it to make sure it wasn't some trick of the light in the study just making it look like there was this shadow in the painting. But I felt the acrylic and sure enough, the shadow was actually there in the painting. See what I mean? Creepy. I genuinely felt weirded out about it. It was one of those moments where you start thinking, why didn't I notice this earlier? Was it there to notice? A couple days later, I was working on a project in my study. It was about 9.30 at night and I just couldn't focus. So I spun around in my chair to take a look at the painting and I felt this sudden vertigo effect like the ground wasn't there. And I had to grab my chair to keep from tumbling into emptiness. You wouldn't have noticed it if you hadn't looked at the painting a hundred times like I had. The hallway was long with exactly six doors. I remember because I counted them the first day. Three on the left, three on the right, each with a little shiny metal doorknob. Only now there were seven doors. Three on the left, four on the right. It didn't make sense. Everything looked proportionally exactly the same, and the far end of the corridor was just as far away, and yet there was a fourth door on the right side of the hallway with its little metal doorknob. I didn't even know which door was the fourth door. That's how well it blended in. I just knew that there were four doors where once there were three. What is going on? I turned away in my chair and looked back, checking several times to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me, but the number of doors remained constant. Seven. I called my dad again. Hello. Hey, Dad, it's me. How are you doing? Oh, can't complain. <laughs> and to what do I owe the pleasure? I've got a question. All right. Be honest. Is this a trick painting you sent me? What do you mean? I mean, it keeps changing. I can see it changing. Not as far as I know. It was just one and a bunch I picked up, all at the same auction. Hmm. Huh. Why do you ask? Is something wrong? Oh, no, no, just curious. Thanks, Dad. You're welcome, son. Anytime. I've got to go. I'll talk to you later, okay? I love you, Dad. Love you too, son. Have a nice day. I will. Thanks again, Dad. Bye. After I got off the phone, I took the painting down and checked the back for some sort of mechanical or digital hocus-pocus, but it was all soft canvas. I left it on the floor behind my office chair facing the wall. The mere thought of it was freaking me out. The next day, I pulled my wife Melissa into my office and held the painting up so she could see it. She hadn't had a chance to do so before. How many doors are there? Um... Seven. There were six when I first got this. She just looked at me like I was being a goofball. <laughs> okay, so... Which one wasn't there before? I have no idea. <laughs> oh. You don't know which door magically appeared? The uh, no, I, uh, but... Honey, I'm in the middle of something. Tell you what, come and find me when you figure it out. <laughs> Melissa went back into the other room. It gets worse. The next time I chatted with Mark, I told him about the extra door in the painting. Are you sure there weren't seven doors to begin with? I know what you're thinking, Mark, but I would swear I counted six. Well, if another one shows up, at least Melissa counted seven and can confirm it then. <laughs> you, know, you know what you should do? 
You should take a photo of the painting so you can prove it if anything else changes. It was a great idea. I got my phone and took a photo of the painting. Two days went by, nothing happened. On the third day, I walked into my office and there was a man staring at me. Well, I mean, it wasn't. I can't say that it was a man or a woman. Honestly, I can't even say that it was human. There was a shape at the end of the hallway in my painting. It oddly lacked the same detail that the rest of the painting had, like someone had hurriedly painted it on. I even ran my hand over it to make sure it wasn't fresh, that someone hadn't actually come in and painted over the original work, just trying to drive me crazy. It was completely dry. The look of it scared me more than anything else, changing painting included. I wish I could do it more justice with words, but the best I can describe it is that it was human-ish, with legs and arms, but squat or hunched and lopsided like somebody had slapped a blurry quasi-moto onto an otherwise beautiful painting. You couldn't see the details of its face, but you could see shading on it, defining warped features. I was almost glad there wasn't more detail to it, except for the fact that it left just enough to the imagination to give one nightmares. But I had proof. Here was proof that the painting was changing, so I brought up the file on my laptop to show my wife for comparison, but when I did, the figure was in the photo I took too. At no point did I start questioning my sanity about all this, Something unnatural and terrifying was going on, so I took the painting out of the house and set it on the curb where we put our trash for pickup. I was so done with that painting, or so I thought. The next evening when I got home from work, it was gone from the curb. I figured someone had seen it and taken it home and I waved my hands and thought, good, now it's someone else's problem. I went inside, played with my daughter Gabby, had dinner, put Gabby to bed and after watching a show with my wife, went into my office to check my email. No, the painting wasn't back on the wall. I made sure of that the moment I walked into the room. But I got a message from Mark, asking if the painting had changed again and asking me to call him to talk about it. I got him on the line, and I told him about the creepy new addition and how I'd gotten rid of the painting. Oh man, that sounds cool. I wish I'd gotten a chance to see it. Well, I can send you the photo I took of it. Cool. So I opened the image file. The thing in the painting had raised its arms. Before, you could only barely make out the arms hanging at its sides, but now, both arms were raised up over its head, and its fingers were spread apart like it was waving hello at me. I think it was waving hello at me. I zoomed in as best as I could without pixelating the image and the shaded contours of the face seemed stretched into a grin. Oh no, 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 no. I sent Mark the file, but the connection kept dropping, so I put it in a folder on my Dropbox account and gave him access to it. Ah, the file's corrupted. I tried to open it as well, but Mark was right. Every time I copied the image, it somehow got corrupted. Must be spooky magic. <laughs> this isn't funny. I'm freaking out here. Sorry. But delete the file if it's scaring you so bad. And that's exactly what I did. I deleted the file. But it gnawed at me, you know? The painting was still changing in horrible, terrifying ways, seemingly acknowledging my observation of it. And now it was gone. But if it was gone, why should it matter? If something unholy happens, it's the problem of whoever has the painting now, right? And they'll see it changing too, won't they? It was two days later, and I was organizing a folder of documents and had accidentally deleted a couple I hadn't meant to. I went into the Windows recycling bin, and you guessed it, there was the image file along with the documents. I had to look. I trembled with dread at the thought of it. But when something that surreal happens to you... You have to witness it to see it through to the end. I recovered the file and opened it. The walls of the hallway seemed to be melting. The partition separating the red from the off-white was lower than it had been before, drooping in places. The ridges on the lights looked like they were peeling off. The carpet seemed less crimson and more reddish-brown. and the figure had taken several steps down the corridor toward the viewer's perspective. 
More details had become defined. Hair hung off its head, long and black like it had been painted with a fine-tipped brush. The eyes were a little more than dull black points under the shading of the brow. The grin came with teeth, uneven and fat like those of a child more than an adult. Its arms extended out on either side of it, touching both walls. One foot was ahead of the other, as if it had caught at mid-step in a game of red light, green light. I realized that I was panting and shaking as I looked at it. It was really hard to breathe. An anxiety attack. The painting was going to make me pass out just from looking at a digital photo of it. I quickly closed the image to calm myself down, but that brought forth another disturbing thought. What if it progresses every time I look away? The only way to stop it is to keep looking. So I open the file again. No change. Oh, no, wait. That wasn't a new change. I had noticed it before, but it hadn't dawned on me. One of the doors was open. There was a dim blue light coming from the room inside. Moonlight, I thought. And just outside the threshold of the door, an object lay on the floor. I zoomed in for better detail. It was a little yellow stuffed lion with a scraggly orange mane, a child's toy. Of all the details, the melting hallway, the grinning fiend with arms wide open, the blue light from the open doorway, it was the innocent nature of that little toy lion that filled me with the most dread. My wife came into the office. Come kiss Gabby goodnight. I went into my daughter's darkened room where she was wrapped up in blankets in her bed, hugging a half dozen stuffed animals and looking cute as could be. My little darling, I love her so much. I kissed my daughter goodnight. She kissed me back and hugged her little pillow pet with a built-in nightlight. It glowed, shifting through a variety of colors. I love you, baby. Daddy, can you get my Simba? Of course, honey. I looked around but couldn't see it anywhere. Where'd you leave it, Gabby? Over there. She pointed to the closet. The door was open, and Simba, her little yellow stuffed lion with the scraggly orange mane, lay on the floor just inside. Seeing it lying there, just past the threshold of the closet door, while the dim glow of my daughter's nightlight faded from red to purple to blue, I felt my heart rise up in my chest. The closet was just a closet. I could see it was just a closet. There were clothes on hangers and bags with toys and blocks in them. They were right there. And yet, as I looked at the stuffed lion lying on the floor, waiting for me, I felt as if I could see carpeting on the floor inside the closet, even though there was none. Carpeting, not in my vision, but in my imagination. And maybe, if I went in and shut the door, I'd find that the walls beyond those clothes had a wooden partition, red below, off-white above, and maybe there was something hunched and terrible shambling its way toward us, even as I stood there staring at that toy. I walked briskly, trying not to look half as frightened as I was, snatching up Simba and shut the closet door. My breathing was heavy, and I struggled to avoid gasping for breath as I tried to calm myself down. Hey, uh, did that poster fall down? I, uh, I should fix that. I pretended to adjust a cat poster that had been on the floor by Gabby's dresser for months. In doing so, I shoved the heavy dresser over so that it partially blocked the closet door. Here's, here's Simba, sweetie. Yay, thank you, Daddy. I love you. I handed the lion to Gabby, gave her a quick hug and kiss, and wished her good night before rushing back to my office. The painting had changed, as I knew it would. The open door was closed, the toy gone from the floor, and the hallway dimly lit with yellow light from the melting lights again. But the thing, that not-quite-human fiend, stood right outside the now-shut door, its body turned to face it with both hands pressed up against the door itself like it was running its hands down it, caressing it. Its head was turned toward me, still grinning that awful, frightening grin full of gnashed, crooked teeth. Oh God, how close had it been? 
No, it's, it's just a closet. The hallway is not there. It's not real. None of this is real. I put up signs around the neighborhood, knocked on doors, asked everyone I knew and many I didn't if they knew who took the painting. I needed to find it and get it back. I wanted to tear it, shred it in my hands, throw it in a fire, and watch it burn to ashes. I prayed it didn't end up in some landfill. For over a week I hunted for that painting. I had put it on the side of the road to be carted off on garbage day, but someone saw it, picked it up, and took it home with them. Who? I don't know. Do they see it changing? Is it terrorizing them now? What do I do? It eats at you, not knowing. I refused to open the image file, afraid to see what it showed, certain that the hideously deformed creature would be twisting the knob on the door that presumably led to my daughter's bedroom. I lay awake, listening for the distinct sound the hinges on that door make, my heart racing like a track runner's. Sometimes I would imagine I heard it and bolt into her bedroom only to find it dark and empty, the only thing audible being the soft sound of her sleeping, the closet door still shut and blocked behind a wall of boxes. In desperation for my own sanity, I removed the doorknob. Then I sat there at my desk, studying the knob, wondering if removing it had made a change in the image. Was the knob gone in the painting? Oh God, it was killing me to know, to see whether I was safe or not. So I opened the file. I opened the image, biting my knuckle in tension. When I saw it, my jaw clenched up so tight, I tasted my own blood and nearly broke my finger. It was there. I mean, it was right there. The monster, the freak, the thing that lived inside that twisted painting was staring right at me, filling the screen. Details so vivid it didn't look like a painting at all. It looked like I'd taken a photo of a disfigured man standing in front of a canvas. You want a description to go with your nightmares? Its skin was like wax, pale, greasy wax. The flesh lumped up in places and sloughed off in others. It was as if someone had tried to build a human head out of modeling clay and then left it out in the rain. There was hair, black and brown and white streaked hair that hung like seaweed off of the top of its head, running down over its face, covering its ears. If you asked me to sum up this thing in one sentence, I would say it looked like a desiccated corpse that got dredged up out of the East River after a week in a hot July. But the eyes, the eyes, the eyes were the worst part. There was a clearness in them, a sinister intelligence that stared back at me as I tore into the flesh of my hand with my teeth. No dullness or milky coloration, just piercing, brown eyes looking dead at me. And a mouth full of teeth curved into a mischievous smile. And I mean full of teeth. It was like looking into a shark's maw. Behind the first row was clearly another row of the same crooked yellowing teeth. Two rows, exposed by its excited grin. That was what it was. Not mischievous at all, but excited. It was happy to see me. It was happy to see me. And as I had that thought, staring in escalating horror at my computer screen, this inhuman nightmare staring back at me, I knew it was true. It could see me. It wasn't just a painting that looked like a freak of nature was staring out of the canvas. It actually was looking at me, out from my screen, just as I was looking at it. Go away. I closed the image. Then I deleted it. Then I emptied the recycling bin just for safe measure. I got up and ran away from the computer. I spent the rest of the day pacing and feeling irritable, snapping at every question my wife or daughter asked until they finally just stopped asking me anything at all. When I close my eyes, I see it. It's there behind my eyelids now, smiling at me, its head cocked ever so slightly like a curious dog. It can't speak to me, but I feel like I know what it was thinking. It was thinking, do you really think you can stop me? No, I don't think I can. My wife came into my office that evening. She stood there, frowning heavily and seemingly waiting for me to say something. 
but I was too distracted to speak up. Finally, she broke the silence. You've got to stop. Stop what? Stop taking things out on me and Gabby. Stop this story about a painting with the monster in it. Stop acting like you're crazy. The painting is real. You saw it. I've got the image on my computer to prove it's still changing. Let's see it. Fine. Oh, wait. I just deleted it. You're giving Gabby nightmares. I had to change her sheets today because she was afraid to get out of bed to go to the bathroom. This has to stop. I'm trying to protect her. I'm trying to protect us. Melissa threw up her hands in frustration. Monsters don't come out of paintings. You're a grown man. Stop acting like a child. Stop scaring your child. It's real, Melissa. You have to believe me. <gasps> After she stormed out of the room, I just sat there holding my head in my hands and tearing at my hair. It felt like my stomach was eating itself from the inside. It groaned and tugged at my guts. Melissa and I had fought before, but never like this. I should apologize, I thought. She was in the bedroom, packing a suitcase. Where are you going? I'm taking Gabby to my parents. In Indiana? For how long? Melissa threw a bunch of clothes in the pile. I don't know. That depends on you. Don't go. Please. Look, you could use some time to relax. I think you've been too stressed lately, and I haven't seen my family in months. I could go with you. She looked at me. Could you? I couldn't. I had taken too much time off already from dealing with Gabby being sick over the winter. I pulled at my hair. Uh, no, probably not. She went into Gabby's room and came back with a pile of her clothes to go in the suitcase. It's a two-day drive. We'll stop in a hotel, like we always do. Gabby likes the one with the big pool. I covered my face. I didn't want her to see that my eyes were brimming with tears. Melissa, please. I could feel her eyes on me. Call me when you get there. I sat at my desk in an empty house, just me and the television to keep me distracted, to keep me from thinking too much. Shut the brain off, don't let the mind wander, you know. I wasn't actually watching it, just listening. If you asked, I wouldn't even be able to tell you what channel it was on. The clock on the wall said it was just after 11 p.m., Melissa and Gabby had left hours ago. They'd most likely be arriving at the hotel they'd made reservations at soon. That was when I got a phone call from Mark. I hadn't talked to him in a couple of weeks, not since the whole nightmare had begun. It felt good to get a little outside contact. Hey, Mark. Haven't heard from you in a while. What's going on? I want you to see something. What is it? Check your phone now. A file. I double-clicked and opened it. It was a photo of the painting. In it, the hallway was back to normal, and no freakish shambling horror was staring at me. Nor was it anywhere to be seen. The walls weren't melting and the lights were normal. It was just like it had looked when I first received it from my father. Except there were eight doors in the hallway. And like before, it fit so perfectly that I couldn't tell you which door was the new one. I closed the file. I thought the file was corrupt. Mark didn't respond, so I continued. It looks just like it did to begin with. Did you do something to it? Look! Again! Something was off. Well, I saw there were eight doors now. I double-clicked the file, and the bottom dropped out of my stomach. There was the painting. There was the hallway. There were the lights. There was the red carpeting. There were the eight doors. And there were my wife and daughter walking into the eighth door. And in the background, 
the shadow of a shambling form coming around the corner. Oh no. All right, what's going on? Mark, where are you? For the love of God, answer me. What's happening? Mark! Hello, Mark! Are you there? Mark! Forget this, I thought. I needed to call Melissa. I disconnected from Mark, moved away from my desk, and frantically dialed my wife. Oh, thank God, Melissa! I just wanted to make sure you were okay. I tried my best to conceal my panic. Yeah, we just got into the hotel room. Good timing. What does it look like? There was a long pause. I could hear Gabby asking questions about the TV in the background. Uh, I'm sorry, what? What does the room look like? Well, actually, what does the hall look like? While I waited, I clicked the image file again. The melting man wasn't there. He wasn't as detailed again, mostly a jumbled smudge of paints, but he was clearly halfway down the hall and staring. Not at the doors of the hallway, but at me again. I could see stipples of white showing the teeth in his grin. Oh no, he's right there. On the other end of the phone, I heard Melissa moving toward the door. Melissa, no! I squeezed the phone in my hand like I was holding her hand and pulling her away from whatever was on the other side of her hotel door. What? What's the matter? No, don't, 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 don't worry about the hall. You can tell me tomorrow. I sat there, staring at the image on my screen. Maybe if I left it up, the thing wouldn't be able to move. Why hadn't I thought of that before? Leave the image up and it can't possibly change, right? But what was up with Mark? Why did he send me the photo? Did he? Had I somehow infected Mark's phone by sending the file to him? You're not Mark, are you? What was that, honey? Oh, no. Had I said that out loud? Oh, well, that, nothing. Just uh, talking to myself. Mommy. I heard Gabby again in the background. Mommy, can we play in the pool? Look, I gotta go. The pool's only open for another half hour, and I promised Gabby she could go swimming. She's all wound up from being in the car. Gabby, honey, do you want to say goodnight to Daddy? Melissa, wait. Goodnight, Daddy. I love you. I love you too, baby. Can you put... We love you, honey. Bye-bye. I... I sat there in the dark of my office, the quiet of my house. Even the television seemed to have gone quiet. I sat there and stared at the image on my computer screen and prayed. Please, God, protect them. He didn't hear me. I should have been with them. I failed. I failed to protect them. Instead of doing something, anything to help, I sat there at my desk all night and stared at the picture of the grinning beast as it lurked in its seemingly frozen state outside the door to my wife's hotel room. It was the phone ringing in the other room that brought me to my senses. I'd been sitting there in a trance, like a zombie staring at the computer screen, my brain in a fog. I shambled into the other room and answered the call. It was a police officer from Pennsylvania calling to give me the bad news. My wife and daughter had been found in the hotel room the following morning. They suspected that Melissa had slipped and hit her head on the tiles while holding Gabby's hand, then fell into the pool, taking our little girl with her. The injury had apparently caused my wife to seize. Gabby had bruises on her arms. I knew what really happened. They had wandered into the realm of that thing in the painting its realm, and it had finally gotten what it wanted. 
I dropped the phone and walked in a trance back into my study. My stomach fought to reject everything inside it. Both legs seemed confused about which direction they were supposed to be going, but I had to keep looking. I had to keep my eyes on the picture. I had to keep the monster in the painting. Melissa and Gabby were waiting for me when I got back to my desk. Their killer had dumped them unceremoniously in the middle of the hallway. There was blood on the walls, on the doors, on the two lifeless forms flopped in the middle of that crimson carpeting. If I hadn't just gotten off the phone, if I hadn't known what my wife and my daughter looked like, I might have mistaken them for just a pair of sloppily painted on additions to the whole scene. It left them for me to see, and now it was gone. I closed the picture and reopened it. Nothing changed. It, it, it was supposed to come from me. It was my curse, not theirs. In a moment, I'll be heading to my daughter's bedroom, and I'm going to move the dresser that's barricading her closet. I'm so sorry, Gabby. Daddy loves you. I'm so sorry, Melissa. It's the only way. I'll see you both soon. The Hourglass Tattoo Written by the Dead Canary Performed by Jason Hill My friends and I were always trying to dare each other into doing stupid stuff. Generally, it involved us all getting super drunk and then making suggestions. If we all agreed somebody had to do something, they would have to do it. Or they'd have to drink from the bottle. The bottle was a former bottle of vodka that now contained any sort of nasty, vile fluids that we collected over time. One sip was guaranteed to make anyone hurl. Looking back on it now... My friends and I were dicks, but things definitely would have been better if I had just drank from the bottle that night. The night I'm talking about was the night I was chosen to get a tattoo, from the lowest rated place Yelp had to offer. I never wanted a tattoo. Everyone else in our group had at least one, with Frank covered in the things, but I had always been a holdout. That was why I was chosen. Being super drunk, as I said, I was less willing to say no. It didn't help that I was the last contributor to the bottle, and definitely didn't want my lips anywhere near it. It didn't take long to find a place online. We had never seen a place get so many negative reviews and still be in business, without being a trolling prank, anyways. These looked genuine, ranging from being stabbed with the needles to getting the wrong tattoo, to getting a staph infection from leaning against a stain on the wall. The guys thought it was perfect for me. I'd never actually been to a business that had its front entrance come in from an alley, but this did. Everyone else waited back at my place while Frank drove me there to make sure I did the deed right. He sat in the lobby with me until I was called back behind a yellow curtain. The guy doing my tattoo looked like an ex-biker who had recently gotten into voodoo. He wore a bandana on his head, probably to hide the fact that he was going bald, most likely. A killing joke jean jacket, the band, not the Batman story, and had a beard long enough to hide gravy stains in his belt buckle. On the shelf behind him were a collection of painted skulls, those Calavera ones from the Day of the Dead festivals and vials filled with used needles, fresh needles, and at least a few shrunken heads. I hoped they were fakes, but they were really... leathery looking. He looked me over and then pointed to a binder full of designs to pick from. I flipped through them, looking for anything unusual enough that I'd never seen it on anyone before, but not so lame that I'd regret my decision in the morning though I was still drunk enough that I'd probably regret anything at this point. 
I finally found one. Towards the middle, an hourglass. A real goth-looking hourglass with spider webs and curled pointy edges, very Tim Burton looking. I gave it to the guy, pointed to the back of my neck, right where a nice business shirt would cover it up, and prepared myself. It took three hours. It shouldn't have taken three hours for something as small as I got, but it did. Every second the needle was running hurt, and hurt bad. But after sweating, swearing, and plotting revenge on all of my friends, one by one, he said it was done. I thanked him, paid him, though the tip was certainly smaller than he probably expected, and went to go see Frank. Frank, mad that he'd waited for so long, asked to see it on the way back to the car. I pulled back my shirt and angled my neck. So, what do you think? He looked at it. Christ, dude, I knew it had to be big, but... Wow, that's a commitment. I can't believe you'd get something that disgusting and... Realistic looking. Disgusting. Realistic. Maybe he'd had more to drink in the lobby. It was a stupid hourglass. Realistic I could buy, but... Disgusting? We got in his car and started driving back. With my neck itching, I asked if he had a mirror in the car so I could get a look at it. Maybe even rub some of that greasy lotion the artist gave me to keep it from drying out. He said there might be a single mirror or something in the glove compartment. I checked, and he was right. I raised it up to look at my hourglass. It was dark in Frank's car, but even I could tell something was wrong. My hourglass, which had looked fine when I was in the tattoo parlor, wasn't an hourglass anymore. It couldn't have been. It was too big. It stretched across my neck completely. I would have never gotten a tattoo like that. But there it was. And I could see why Frank said it was disgusting. It was a car wreck. A truly disturbing one with twisted metal and a corpse hanging out of the windshield. Blood and glass everywhere. What in the hell was I looking at? Frank must have noticed my look of surprise. What, did the guy give you the wrong one? I guess that's why they're so low rated. You really gotta be careful, I almost had the same thing happen to me on the one on my forearm here. You know, that guy I thought I wanted a Garfield and not a Snow Leopard? I would have been embarrassed. I never heard him finish. He was cut off by a loud roar as something smashed into the car. I felt it spin through the air, but I remembered nothing else before waking up on the road. It can't have been a long time because there were no emergency vehicles around, but I stood up, with only a dull pain in my arm and the only injury I could feel. I was lucky, considering I had been wearing my seatbelt and yet had still been thrown from the car. Frank wasn't so lucky. The car lay in a puddle of leaking fluids, and when I came closer, I saw he was hanging out at the driver's side window. He was... shredded by glass, and not moving. The way he was hanging looked familiar, and the longer I looked at his ruined body, the more I realized what I was looking at. The tattoo on my neck. The wreck looked just like... The tattoo. I was checked by the emergency personnel who arrived who confirmed that I had bruised my arm and gotten a few superficial cuts. Frank had been killed on impact. The truck driver who had hit us had fled the scene and was caught a little ways up the road. Thing is, if he had stayed, he wouldn't have been at fault. Frank had run a stop sign. I didn't talk to anybody for a while. I wasn't sure if I was just in mourning or if I was still scared about my tattoo. Since the night of the accident, it was clearly back to being an hourglass. I couldn't be sure, but I thought there was more sand in the bottom than there had been when it was first done. The night of Frank's funeral, a closed casket, obviously, the guys and I got together to have some drinks in his honor at a local microbrew. 
Eric was the first to remember that I had gotten the tattoo and wanted to see it. I let him, but I was reluctant. Dude, sick! What the hell? Who'd even let you get that? My stomach twisted. I had to see what he had seen. I excused myself and went to the bathroom. I still had the mirror from Frank's car. It had survived the crash and I held onto it just in case. Looking in both mirrors, I saw the tattoo had changed again. It showed a man whose head had been smashed to a pulp, but the body was still holding a glass raised in toast. I ran back out to the group and told them maybe we should go on home and meet back up tomorrow. They all agreed, except Eric, who said he'd call for an Uber or something that he wanted a couple more drinks. I thought maybe that if I left he'd be okay. Maybe if my neck was cursed or something it would leave him alone if I got as far away as I could. I went to sleep. The next morning, I got a frantic call from Jeff. It was Eric. He had gone missing. A few hours later, Jeff called again. Eric was dead. He had apparently gotten blind, stinking drunk and started getting loud and screaming that he wanted to fight someone. He got kicked out, and he thought it would be a great idea to walk home by himself. He passed out on the railroad tracks. The train hit his head and never even slowed down. They found him early in the morning, but it took a while to find out because they needed fingerprints to identify him. I checked my tattoo. Hourglass again. More sand was definitely in the bottom than there was before. I went back to the tattoo parlor and asked about the guy who gave it to me. I found out he'd been fired. Turns out he falsified his application form. The name and address he gave weren't his. He had taken his stuff and left before anyone could call the police. No one knew who he really was. After Eric's funeral, I didn't go out drinking. I stayed at home. I found myself watching the tattoo. It was the only thing I could do. It was a mistake to be alone, though. My remaining friends decided to check in on me and make sure everything was okay. Jeff brought the bottle with him, not to drink from, but just to remember better times. And then he made a comment asking if I had got the tattoo worked on because he didn't remember it being big enough to see over the top of my shirt. No. I wouldn't let it hurt anyone else. I would stop it. It was the stupidest thing I'd ever done without being drunk. I grabbed the bottle and smashed it on the table. Everyone shouted as I ran out of the room and up to the bathroom where the mirrors were still set up, where I watched every day to see what the shape of the tattoo would take next. I saw it was no longer the hourglass, but didn't look at what it was now. I locked the bathroom door, held tight to the gooey, liquid-coated edge of the bottle's neck, and started cutting. It hurt. It hurt so bad. But it had to go. I vaguely remember the door busting open and someone calling an ambulance, going to the hospital. I did live, as I'm writing this now, one skin graft and many psych evaluations later, I was discharged. So far, nothing more has happened, but I'm still afraid. You see, nobody found the piece of skin I had cut off. I had stared at it, long and hard, before my friends broke down the door. I'd thrown it into a drawer and hid it. When I came home, I found it. It was the hourglass again. But even on that now dead tissue, it still changes, I think. I swear more sand is still falling through the hourglass even without it being attached to me. There's only a few grains left. Which means... Now I look for it to change, to go back to the image that I'd seen that night.
The image that I now realize nobody ever saw but me. Jeff never got a good look at it. It means that was my fate. And with the grains left in the hourglass, it'll be any day now. On that piece of severed skin that night was an image of a man. A flayed, skinless man. He sits in a puddle of his own blood, holding strips of his own skin and a knife. The strips are all covered in tattoos. And he's laughing. Chilling tales for dark nights.